So let me welcome you to the, today's lecture. The la in the last lecture, we uh, stopped at the point uh, after the presentation of Knutella. And uh, now we are looking into the um, unstructured heterogeneous pit P overlays. <coughs> Just to recapitulate, recapitulate, we introduced the term homogeneous and heterogeneous for the properties of the nodes. So either we consider all the nodes as equal, then, we, then they are homogeneous, or we consider them as different, so with different capacities, which we want to take and also to use, and that's heterogeneous. <coughs> So today we will see some heterogeneous unstructured P2P overlays, basically starting with Knutella 0.6, which identified that there were some flaws with Knutella 0.4, so there, that didn't scale very good. And then we look into some decentralized file sharing, either with distributed servers or with super nodes. <coughs> and you also have a um, short view on uh, Skype, how Skype does it. <coughs> so again the classification where it's uh, placed so we had until now the centralized peer-to-peer -peer, the homogeneous peer-to-peer -peer networks and now the heterogeneous ones and they are still unstructured so there's no specific information where the data is stored that we are looking for <coughs> so what was the motivation so on one side we had the centralized peer-to-peer um, -peer overlays where the server had the global index of what files exist and once asking the server where you can find the documents that you are looking for, you could download uh, directly. So that was good. So fast searches. <coughs> However, the robustness was the problem. So if you took the server away, then uh, your application was broken. Nutella was good in it because no individual peer was uh, really needed. But on the other side, it didn't scale very well. So the idea was to take the good properties of both, on the, rob the robustness on the one hand, and um, so no peer should be very cr critical, every peer should be able to fail, and also to have some fast searches by some more centralized uh, indexing. <coughs> and here you yeah, already see the properties of these heterogeneous peer-to-peer uh, -peer overlays, how it might look like. What you see in this picture is that you have uh, the black nodes, which are quite um, weak, so they they do not have much bandwidth and they should not be taken for indexing. And you have the stronger peers, which are red, which are taking care that, uh, which are basically taking the role of the, the indexing uh, peers. So they store all the information which files the corresponding peers in their area um, take. So you can think of uh, the... Um, Super peers and their corresponding peers as um, small Napster, and the super nodes themselves create some Knutella network. Yeah, and this is the main principle of how it works. So, what's good? Of course, it's more robust and centralized solution, so you can take away, of course, any s normal peer, but also any super peer without interrupting the service. And you have a faster, ser faster search because not all nodes, so only a small uh, ratio of all nodes are participating in the super peer network. So it's like a smaller Knutella and the uh, queries are processed faster. What's the bad drawback? You somehow have to, to choose which peers to take as super nodes and which to leave aside. So it's a, bit, a little bit more complex. Also, what still remains as a drawback for some applications is uh, the property of the unstructured network. So you still cannot really um, find a specific object that you want stored if you are looking for it. So you just um, perform a key-based key um, keyword based search. Okay, let's uh, have a look at examples. One very important and um, well-known um, solution was eDonkey. So that was very popular in around 2004 or 5, um, also 2003, and it was generating in uh, in 2003. So peer-to-peer -peer, uh, it was generated more than 50% of the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing traffic. Uh, and uh, Kazar was especially on, in Germany only generating 44% of all internet traffic. So very popular. However, um, eDonkey, and we'll see how it works, they operated, they didn't have a special user-operated peers which were selected, but you could set up some servers. 
So the super Pearson e donkey, like it said, it's a decentralized file sharing with distributed servers. The super Pierce were servers, and the most famous one, which I also used that time, was Razorback 2. And it was uh, disconnected by the Belgium p police, and um, as any really a lot large number of peers was connected to there, um, somehow that was um, a big hit for the peer-to-peer -peer community using eDonkey. And later on it didn't really recover from that hit. So although you could elim eliminate every server and every super node in the network, it was still a big issue if you took the most important one out. So how did it work? So we had this in eDonkey. You had two types of nodes. So the, the gray ones are the normal peers. They are casual P, uh, user PCs. And these greenish ones, these are distributed servers. And uh, these distributed servers that you can think of like in Napster, so the peers went online. They connected to some of these peer, uh, some of these um, servers and they announced what kind of uh, files they have. And the servers themselves uh, exchange this information between themselves. So if there was one um, query, for example, from this node looking for a specific file, he asked his um, corresponding server, his super peer, whether he knows some peers that contain that file. So most of all, these kind of peers. But that server also knew the file lists of other servers, which they regularly interchanged. So it was quite useful. It's like a distributed Napster that you can think of. Okay, and what the clients could also do is um, they didn't, they were not connected to only one server, but probably to two or, th or three. So very simple solution. Yeah. So what um, is the what kind of um, protocols did you had? First of all, the join protocol, so how you attach to a specific node, that was very simple. You just contact him and tell him what kind of files you have. Then once you are contacted, you uh, connected, then you can perform a search, so ask him what you are looking for. The servers, they had a serverless exchange protocol in which they exchanged the information about the files they knew. And um, once you find some node that has a specific file, of course, you had a direct peer-to-peer -peer download. <coughs> okay. So how was then the... Um, how do you find then... How do you join the network? So first of all, um, the, the servers exchange the information between each other, so ports and IPs of other servers. And the servers also send the list of servers they knew. So once you knew a specific server, then you get also to know the list of other servers. And if you don't know any server at all, then there were still websites listing the ports and IPs of that servers. So it was very easy to find um, yeah, servers that um, are hosting some, yeah, some file lists. In uh, eDonkey, there was um, additional um, help to identify files. So they introduced this MD4 hashing, which allowed to um, hash the content of the file. So you could really identify specific files, and that also helped to identify whether the same file was located at several positions. So you could also once you stated a request for the content, for if you define the keywords, then you ask your server, he was listing back the list of files, and they were also uniquely identifiable. So you could also find out that, for example, two nodes have the same file, and then you could also download from them in parallel. So you could um, download parts from node A and download part 2, by uh, node B. And once you finish to download the file, then you could also check by creating the MD4 hash whether you downloaded it correctly or not. So that was a small improvement. Okay, the search itself was very um, um, 
yeah, sophisticated, so you could really look for a wide set of keywords. So at that time, it was very popular to really look for MP3 files, and then you could define album names and uh, singer names. And um, so you could contact your server to whom, to whom you had a TCP connection, so that you always had a direct contact, but you could also uh, send the search query to some other servers by a UDP message. And this server list, as I said, you always retrieve from your own server that you were connected to. So he regularly updated you with a server list. Okay. Yeah, and once um, you get to know which files are existing, the files are identified by their hashes, you can um, query the servers for clients yeah, offering these files. So then you are informed of which servers have clients um, having this file and then you can send a direct request for tell me who are these clients. Okay, um, these are some uh, numbers from the eDonkey network and uh, what they show is basically from uh, 2004 um, distribution, so this uh, the next two pictures, so one is the, the file size and one is the, the downloaders and uh, what you see from this network and this graph is uh, the yeah the file size distribution so there are only very few um, files that are very big and shared by only a few and there are very many files um, that are shared by uh, a lot of users so few files shared by a lot and many files and big files shared only by a few so that's also, yeah, the question is what kind of distribution is this? And this is also the ZIPF distribution that we had in uh, last or pre-last uh, lecture. And that means that if you rank the, the file sizes, like it's here, if you rank the file sizes from very big to very small, then it's very probable that you have a lot of users who only share small files and only very few who share large files. And also the number of uh, shared files. So the previous picture was the, the size of the f of the files, and this is the number of files. Again, here as well, you have a lot of users, uh, more than 100, which share very few files, and uh, very few users who share many files. So this is also, if you would be able to see this logarithmically, on a logarithmical scale, this is like a, a line. And this ZIP distribution is occurring very often in peer-to-peer -peer environments that you should keep in mind. Okay, so the problem with um, eDonkey was prob basically um, that although they introduced these different roles, so they had strong servers which they which were interconnected and um, to which you could connect like in Napster. Uh, the problem was still that the servers were too powerful and uh, the network wasn't robust. If you take out the most important one, then um, the most of the content is also lost. So the idea was to not have uh, servers anymore as super peers, but to have super nodes. So these are also, um, net also nodes, f user PCs, privately operated, but you do not uh, define them in first instance that they are more important than the other nodes, but they only emerge over time um, as more powerful and get a more important role. So you have the uh, variation of the roles. So you start as a normal peer, and I think the rule was after five hours um, in the network and after offering a specific amount of bandwidth, you become a super peer. So it's more dynamic. So even if you pick out some of the super peers, new super peers will come into play. Yeah, and Kazar was the most uh, famous uh, user of it and also very popular. Um, yes, yeah. And um, the developer, I think they previously Morpheus was very important uh, before Kazan and they had some issues so Kazan came to play and was most important in 2002-2003 and also looking at the numbers at from that time um, in, in 2002 they had um, yeah most of the users, most of the files and very many users at all. 
Okay. So the idea was this time to really introduce super nodes that are operated by user devices and to both have the central indexing like in Napster to help with um, fast searches but also to not have too much overhead like in Knutella so um, that it becomes unscalable. So what is the idea? Yeah, the idea is you have um, two types of um, of peers, so the the grey ones are the normal peers, of course, and the, the the green ones are the super peers. And typically, around the super peer, there are ten to fifty normal peers. Yes, and the normal peers they are only connected to the super peers. Again, like in Napster, they join the network by knowing some of these super peers or asking uh, some of the peers they know. And they connect to the super peer and tell that peer what kind of files they have. The super peers, they are elected from the normal nodes, so they with time only emerge as that to become that uh, to become that role. And they are peers with high performance network connection connections. They, they are powerful and uh, long lasting, long living enough in the network to become to get that role. So they take the role of the central server and um, as connection point for simple peers. What their task is to do is to list the files that the connected peers have and um, to operate in the search procedure. And in this case um, because it's so dynamic, so also the super peers might go online, no super peer really becomes so powerful that it's critical for the network. So there are always uh, new super peers coming and going, and also normal peers are coming and going, but um, it's still improving the performance in comparison to Knutella. Um, I will come to that point later. So how is the how is then the, the search be performed in Kazar? So if you started a search query, so this is a very small network, so it's little probably not so easy to explain, but if you were that node and you were looking for a specific file that's for example located here and there, then you only ask your own super peer. So you send a message and tell him I am looking for a file with the keywords mp3 and uh, new music. Then he has a list of connected super peers to whom he forwards his message to, like in Knutella. So you can think of the super peer network as a Knutella network in which the query is flooded and the results are then um, forwarded back to the requesting super node and he sends the results back to the node. So you can really think of two different overlay types. So this is more Napsterish, so with the normal nodes connected to uh, the super peers and they also state the queries like that. So they just ask the server and the super peers are connected in like in, in the Knutella network and the query that is stated at one point is uh, sent around in the network, so it's flooded in the network and the results fitting to that query are passed back to the requesting peer. And by introducing the super peers, as you can see, you still have somehow the Knutella protocol for looking uh, for search, yeah, for queries inside, but it's only for a reduced number of peers, which are known to be very powerful. So the probability that they can handle all these queries is high. <coughs> okay, some issue that was, uh, still occurring. Ah, I will come to that. Again, that's not the best slide. Okay, so what are the still the problems with uh, Kazaa? So now we had, um, so very previously there were some issues with Napster, there were some issues with Knutella. So the one wasn't robust, the second wasn't uh, scalable. So what is the problem now with Kazaa? So the problem is, on the one side, it's still keyword based search. You don't know what you get and that's not really a functionality that is very common in the internet. So in Google it's okay because you're looking, f you don't know what you're looking for but if you type in a URL then you really want to get a website up behind it and you don't know, you do not want to type in a URL and 
just a random search. So you really want to, typically in an application, if you want to use it, you would like to say, I'm looking for exactly this, and please get me that. Pollution is also a problem. <coughs> so some um, mechanism and some approach how the music industry and media industry try to attack these networks because they couldn't really attack, they didn't have any servers is by introducing uh, false fi files. So they introduced a lot of uh, Eminem and um, Britney Spears songs um, which were corrupt and containing silence or containing some uh, random noise and the chance to get a good file was around 10% for some kind of files. And especially if you have small files where it's very easy to um, to offer a lot of that kind of files it was very frustrating for the users to um, to find content that that they liked, so that was all also valid. And one another problem was also that you had to fully download the file before starting to upload it. So you could identify where the files are located. That's good. Then you started to download the files. But you had to first finish your download before you could offer it. And typically, at that time, also, the it was not very popular to to leave the PC on and uh, just share for 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 whomever. But you typically stopped uh, your your device and your um, client after downloading. So only very few uploaders were online because only those were counted as uploaders who already downloaded it. So, and that was a problem for large files, because after downloading the movie, you turn your device off and nobody is then uploading. So you are not uploading. That's, that wasn't both a problem for small files and for large files. We will see how this will be lo solved. <coughs> Some um, pictures about the usage statistics, and that's also showing which trend was caught up. Uh, later on, so in the beginning of 2004, Kazaa was most popular, and uh, also Emule, uh, some some successor of Idanki. But what started from then on and still raising is uh, torrents were very popular. So BitTorrent was then the solution, basically, both for small files and for large files, especially for large files. And what uh, BitTorrent introduced, what we will see later, is um, basically these parallel downloads that while you are downloading you are also uploading uh, content and with that you always have some uploaders in the network. Okay, um, why is uh, Skype shown here? So Skype you probably also know. It's uh, not a file sharing tool but uh, um, yeah, voice over IP internet telephony tool. And um, the interesting fact about it is it's also by the people who uh, propagated and who used who invented Casa so it is also assumed to use the same to technology so the same the very similar peer to peer overlay and um, what they did is instead of storing and offering files you have only basically a buddy list and you look for your buddies and once you have the connection to all of your buddies you create uh, direct uh, links to them and you can call them and have this uh, video or voice streaming so chatting yeah very popular and um, it's very interesting because uh, Skype didn't make much um, revenue so it wasn't very profitable at all from the peer-to-peer -peer point of view what they made their money with is uh, Skype out so that you also could call regu regular phone numbers and um, that's how they make their money with with peer-to-peer -peer as such they weren't able to do it to make money so and uh, why is it uh, somehow useful um, to use Skype so why did they had some benefit in comparison to at that time call by call um, providers were very popular so you either had your expensive um, service provider for, for telephony or you could call by call and the benefit of Skype was um, just having a look first by uh, call by call so what they did is you first had to have a local connection to some server that's probably telecom then it was transmitted to the other country where you were 
calling to, probably to the US, and in US you had some telephone company, and all of these three lines had to be paid. What could be improved in that is to use the internet for the uh, for the international com for the international calls. So, but you still had to pay your telecom and in the foreign internet telephone provider for their for blocking one individual phone line. And Skype's benefit was that you were using the internet, which was assumed to be free. So you anyway have had a flat rate, which was not the case for telephone calls and especially not for international calls but the internet is anyway international and you had an international internet flat and what you only uh, what Skype only had to pay if you were calling some uh, foreign number then you were using the internet all the time except the public service telephony network at the end so they had a um, money um, so they had some savings on their on their provider side and so they could offer some better prices and that's how they make now their money okay so how's the architecture uh, skype is uh, still uh, closed to us and they uh, do not really announce it freely what special protocols they use so they were just some measurements and some uh, testing to identify whether they use the uh, some similar protocols like Kazaa and that's also somehow validated and what they do is that they also create the supernode structure so your own device can also become a supernode you it's very similar to Kazaa and uh, you have your buddies and um, what they introduced however is a Skype login server which you is used for authentication so that you can firstly join the network. Otherwise it's very similar. So I think also at the Skype server you store your buddy list and then once you log in you get your buddy list and then you start searching for your buddies and again you start only ask your own supernode. The supernode floods the supernode network with your query for your buddies and you get the results. And the nice thing about Kaza in comparison to file sharing is that typically you only log in once a day and you only start one query. So it's not very uh, frequent. So there are no so not so frequent queries. And also if you refresh your buddy list, it's not done very instant, in so not very often. But only if you yourself join and look for your buddies, then you also inform them that you are online. So there are only very few queries in the network. And this is quite favorable for this kind of network. Okay, so that was um, the final slide for unstructured P2P overlays. Uh, so what did we have? Centralized P2P overlays, Napster, some homogeneous where all the nodes were similar in Nutella and Bubblestorm, and then we had some um, heterogeneous unstructured network like uh, eDonkey or Casa and Skype. So the next slide set will be I hope so. No, that's <coughs> Okay. So after unstructured um, after having a look at uh, unstructured P2P overlays, we will have now a look at structured P2P overlays. Uh also this slide set is uh, based basically on communication networks too from Darmstadt where I've been prob previously um, working. Okay, so what is the point with uh, structured overlay networks? We will see what distributed hash tables are, what are the principles of distributed hash tables, um, what kind of operations are involved, and then we learn some very prominent P2P overlays like Cord, Content Addressable Network CAN, Pestry, there's also some interface, routing interface for this kind of overlays called key-based routing and um, we have a look at FreePestry and Cademlia. So I think probably today we just uh, managed to come until court. Okay, so what's, what are structured P2P overlays at all? So we had in the 
very first uh, lecture, the classification between a structured and unstructured peer-to-peer -peer network. And what is coming now into play is that the peers have some specific responsibilities for, for files. You, so the pli files are not placed somewhere randomly, but you have a clear responsibility. And for that, we have this distributed hash table, and we will see how we can use it for data retrieval, how, what distributed uh, indexing is, and how it all works. Yes. Okay, so what is the main property of uh, um, structured of a structured peer to peer overlay that 's basically you have both peers and objects with unique identifiers so that 's typically ranging from zero to two to the power of one hundred twenty eight so very large set of numbers and you both the peers and the objects have an i d and um, what further is done what is not in an unstructured peer-to-peer uh, -peer overlay given is that each each peer is responsible for a specific range of uh, object IDs. So if you take the big ID range from zero to a very large number then every peer is somewhere spread over this ID space and around that peer you have also an, a range, an ID range and all of the IDs which belong in this range are managed by that peer. And all of the objects which are in this range are also managed by that peer. So you don't need any more to search for objects, but if you know the object ID, you can have a specific routing mechanism that brings you to the peer uh, who is responsible for that object file. And if you want to store the file, then um, you you store the f yeah the the file at that specific peer and if you want to look it up that means um to find it again then you have a routing mechanism which makes shu sure that your query is sent along a specific path to that peer who is responsible for that specific id and then you can retrieve the file from that node yeah you will see also yeah, some hypercubes and deprogene graphs and DHDs which uh, implement this kind of lookup or routing functionality. So, um, again, to the routing, because it's really an essential difference to the search, is what you want to have is to have a routing mechanism that means if you want to publish a, an object, so this is a movie file or something else, then you use the routing functionality to identify the peer, in this case node B, who is responsible for the ID of this object. And then you publish um, at that specific uh, peer. So you either store it there or you, or you tell node B that you have the corresponding file. And if somebody else, so this is the routing path, for example. And if somebody else is looking for the same file, known by the same identifier, then he also uses the routing functionality and uh, the request is sent to the node who is responsible for that node ID. And um, because you published your document at that node B, the document can then now be found easily and retrieved via direct peer-to-peer -peer communication. So in this case, you see the main yeah, difference to Knutella. So there's no f flooding anymore. There's only a clever routing mechanism which directs the, your query or your publish uh, or your announcement message to one specific peer responsible for that node uh, for that peer ID. So what is the motivation? So what is uh, formally the difference of uh, a distributed hash table and routing to the previously seen mechanisms? And the motivation is, on, of course, on one side that it's more efficient because by saving redundant messages and redundant traffic, um, you only have a necessarily, uh, you only have the messages that are really necessary. So it's more efficient. And uh, the um, motivation is further than that you can um, use this peer-to-peer -peer overlay network in a structured manner to 
store some specific value under a specific key. So it's not anymore a search that you don't know what you really will get, but you know exactly what you will get if you look for a specific key. And there are also several approaches implementing it. So it's very nice. And uh, comparing it to the previously seen solutions with the central s uh, server and flooding search, here we have a so-called distributed indexing. So we have an index like also in uh, in Napster listing the files that are somehow available in the network, but the index is distributed over the all of the nodes. And um, we also had this uh, distributed index, so that means that the, the list of which files exist in the network is split among the nodes that we also had in Kazar with the super nodes. So also there, there was a distributed index. But in this um, case, the index is not split over only a subset of all nodes, but over really all nodes. And with the routing mechanisms, we are able to have a guaranteed overhead, so how long it takes to really find content that you are looking for. And uh, in distributed indexing, so in this distributed hash tables, it's O of log N hops. And this is maintained by also having O log N uh, routing information. So in Knutella, the routing information was basically O of 1, so you defined, let's say, 20 neighbors, that was a fixed number, and you had as an outcome an unsure, yeah, the, the overhead that you generated with a query was uh, around O of N if you flooded all of the net nodes were contacted. Um, yes, in, in distributed indexing it was tried to maintain the the routing information, so how much routing information one node has to store. It's not anymore O of 1, but O of log n, so it's depending on the number of nodes in the network, but with that you could also have a routing in a guaranteed um, number of steps, which is also O of log n. So, what kind of um, aspects come together in this distributed indexing? So, what is needed? So, what is needed for distributed indexing is that you have data and nodes, so the data is um, content of files, and the nodes, they have both identifiers, they are both on the same ID space, and um, what you want to do is to have a routing mechanism so that you can really identify who is the peer responsible for the content I'm looking for. And in order to implement it, you have some nodes in between, so if you have a large network, then you some have to have somehow a mechanism that helps you to send a message from you to the peer responsible for the content that you are looking for. So that means that the nodes in between have to have some routing information in which direction they should forward the message. So if you think of a random graph, um, then you would like to know for this routing protocol if you receive a query to which other node to send the message further on. So that means, yeah, forwarding in the direction of the destination. Okay, and um, one benefit of this routing in comparison to search is, with this specific mechanism, routing mechanism, you can really give a clear statement whether the content exists in the network or not. And that is um, by the point that if the routing mechanism follows always the path that is that it uh, is defined and it comes to the point where it should be and the content is not there, then you can also say at all that it's not in the network at all. So how the, que the question is now, how can we have on a large scale network, how does the routing mechanism look like so that we can really guarantee that we find the content that we are looking for? So what kind of routing information do we need? How do we maintain it? And uh, that's the one question. And the second part is what we had in uh, Kazar and Knutella, so this fuzzy queries, this keyword-based search, that's not supported in, uh, this, in these distributed hash tables and this 
distributed indexing. So that's probably a drawback. So on the one side, we changed now the the keyword-based search to have a, a lookup and a routing, but we cannot have them both. Yeah, and that was the motivation. So to really look for the state of the nodes, how much they have to store about the content in the network on one side, and how long it takes to find the content on the other side, and to find a good um, compromise. And uh, looking at these um, graphs, on one side we had of course the central server, which had the information over all nodes, so O of N, and for that it had a very quick uh, lookup of O of 1, and on the other side we had a state of the node of um, static factor, like O of 1 in, in, in Clutella, where you only had 20 neighbors and that's it, and you don't know anything about other nodes, but it took you magnitudes of uh, the number of nodes or objects in the network to find what you are looking for. And the distributed indexing is basically located in the middle with O of N. So you have both the node state is O of log N and also the lookup time requires O of log N hops to find um, the desired objects that you are looking for. And it's not only the lookup time but also the communication overhead that means uh, how many messages are generated that's also O of log N. And what is good is there are no false negatives. So if the content is in the network, then it's also found. And if it's not, then it's not. And uh, there are also some other um, improvements in terms of uh, failures or robustness. So what is the exact... Um, interface that this distributed indexing uh, provides us. So previously it was somehow easier to think of with the keyword based search there you typed in some keywords and you received a list of files and of peers that were containing these files. And with distributed indexing and distributed hash tables we have a new interface and again what is now the um, interface that we have and that is um, you can publish um, data item or insert a data item under a specific key and later on you can look up the data by defining the key so this is uh, yeah in this case you define both so you give both the data and the key and later on you just give the key and get the data back so this is the interface and it's very handy also if you want to build some distributed data structures or if you want to have more complex data you just can store any kind of data any kind of link structure and retrieve it later on so that's very useful however what you have to know is somehow later the exact key that you are looking for so you have to know what you are what you want to have Okay, so when uh, designing such a distributed, yeah, and that's why it's also a distributed hash table. We will come also what a hash table is, uh, but um, when designing such a distributed hash table, when you really want to implement that kind of interface on a distributed network, then you have several um, requirements that you have somehow to take care of. So first of all, you have some side characteristics like flexibility. It should be reliable, that means that you really find the content if it's there and it should be scalable so that even if you have uh, 100 million of nodes you are not generating too much overhead so that the nodes are overloaded. What you also want to have is some equal distribution among the uh, nodes. So if you store some content inside or if you perform some queries or lookups the nodes should be somehow e also equally handled and uh, loaded with um, traffic overhead or message forwarding load. And what you also want to have is um, what have been learned from eDunkey is um, that you want also perma permanent adaptation to um, joining nodes, to leaving nodes, also to faulty nodes. So if they go online and offline that should be natural and the mechanism, the protocol should adapt 
to it. So what you also need all the time is that you have to assign the responsibilities all the time to, to you have to reassign them and redistribute the responsibilities. As it was said in structured peer-to-peer -peer overlays, the peers are responsible for a specific domain, a specific idea range, and depending on the number of peers and their neighbors, that's varying, and you have to maintain the actual um, ra ID range for which the peers are responsible. And how this is done, there are several concepts, several overlays, and we will have a look. The question, next question is, uh, why is it a distributed hash table? And this is a... Um, refresh of what a hash function is. So a hash function, what it does is that it uh, maps a large input domain and the input domain might be infinitely large onto a smaller target domain. So if you, for example, um, think of MD5, which is a hash and it's 160, so the, the smaller target domain is 160 bits, for example. That's the outcome, and what you can hash is any file that might be gigabytes. So the input of what you given to the hash function, that's, that can be indefinite, that can be small, that can be very large. But the output is always of the same size. And what you want to have from that hash function is that you have get only a few collisions. So it doesn't matter how what kind of content you put in, the output should be somehow evenly randomly distributed. What you use this hash functions for is typically um, a hash table that you can assign for any kind of um, large input, for example a file, um, you get as an output uh, the, the hash and with the hash table you can make a very fast lookup. So that means that you can identify, although you are hash table is limited in space, you can have a very quick lookup of what is stored inside. And this is basically uh, by using the key and the hash as an index. And there are data structures which allow you to have an O of 1 lookup time in hash tables with respect to the number of records in the table. That means if you want to store some content under a specific key, like uh, uh, the hash, for example, then you can use a hash table and store the content under this specific key and look it up later. And this is frequently used in local implementations, in local programming of code, and it's very useful. Um, the questions, so the, here the question is if the hash is not equal, does it imply that uh, the content is not equal? And this is uh, true, so that means if the hash is different, then also the content is different. But if the hash is uh, equal, then we do not know whether the content is equal, because you might also have uh, x and y which are different, but having the same hash. So it's that's the, the reason why... So if it would be perfect, then you could have um, direct... Um, Closing that means that you could this identify whether two objects are equal when their hashes are equal. If you would be able to do so, then um, that would somehow not work out in math. Okay, so just to, to summarize, these hash tables are very well known data structures and for local programming. If you want to have write a program and uh, as a fixed size array for looking up content that you are storing inside. So that's very useful and that you can insert and delete and uh, look up the co entries in it. Very nice. Okay, and the, the hash functions are mainly used in it to identify where to store the data in this hash maps. We will have an example for it. And what a good hash function is, is uh, of course it should be fast to compute because you need it all the time. It should have a good distribution of the keys into the hash tables. That means that all hash places and uh, all outcomes in the, in the algorithm should be equally probable. And um, yeah, a good one is SHA-1. 
to have an example for hash functions is uh, a very simple hash function would be um, x mod 10. That means if you insert a, a specific number or a list of numbers that could go also go into the millions, but it's simpler to use these numbers, so 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. And by applying the hash function, so this is the possible list of outcomes, um, then you identify where to store the, docu the, the inserted numbers in. And if you want to look up a specific uh, um, content that is stored under, for example, 5, then you just have to know uh, the key under which you stored it, and then you can look it up. So it's easy to find a given key in zero uh, in O of 1 um, lookup time if it's present in the table. Okay, so of course this is a very simple example for a hash function and uh, especially that we use less values than their keys. Typically they are often uh, collisions occurring, so that means two numbers are placed on the same uh, key. And that needs some additional processing to rearrange them and to still make them uniquely identifiable. Also, what is uh, not uh, visible in this example is that typically um, the time to search grows linearly with the amount of also of, of inserted values. The time to insert a new value also grows and decreases with the number of values. So that's also not so visible in this example. And um, what is also difficult in distributed hash tables is that the hashing and the placement of the peers uh, need to be adapted to the amount of um, available peers. So there are some issues how to implement this kind of uh, structure in a distributed environment, but uh, there are also a lot of P2P overlays that are doing so. So we'll have a look at some. Okay, so having the main concept of a local hash table in, in mind, so we look at how to distribute it. So what is the meaning of distributing a hash table? So again, it's very important to have the nodes and the data mapped on the same address space. Um, that means they have um, flat identifiers, so only single dimensional IDs, and they have a common address space. And what's the most important, nodes are responsible for um, data, so that means for the object IDs which are part of their address space. So all of the peers are responsible for a specific range in this address space. And um, also this association of data to nodes, so this responsibility function may change over the times as n nodes come into the network or leave. Yes. And we will see how the lookup function looks like. So in a very, very general distributed hash table, what you can think of is to have this kind of linear structure, basically starting somewhere here at 1. And um, there's an overlap. So you have basically a ring from 0 to 2 to the power of m minus 1, for example. And um, you can still think like a hash table of this uh, data structure, but what is done further is that the hash table is split up in specific regions. So over there you can see how it is, for example, split up. So these are individual peers and they are only responsible for some of the range, some of the ranges, sub-ranges in that ID structure. So we have, uh, yeah, what is given, a very large um, a very large ID range, which is typically much larger than the number of available nodes or objects. And uh, we split up this region in smaller blocks and assign them to the peers. Yes. Okay, so f how do we further continue then with the hash table? So here again, here you see the normal network 
uh, internet topology, for example. Then you have this uh, overlay with the distributed hash table, which typically is represented as a ring, and the ring is splitting the ID range in smaller blocks, basically. And in this case, for example, the node 3485 is responsible for the data items in range 2907 to 3485. And uh, also in this case you see what is very common is that the nodes know their neighboring nodes so that they can really create a ring structure. And uh, yes, every node is responsible for um, um, value range and what you also see is that the underlying ID IP topology, so the n internet, is not really related to the overlay network. So the peers may might be located everywhere around the world. They have new neighborhoods, and that's not related. Okay, so now, as splitting up the whole ID range in smaller parts, uh, the question is how do we find now content that we are looking for? And first of all, you have to know the key for that content that you are looking for. Um, and second, you want to have a, a very clever routing mechanism that somehow is also very fast. So if you have a centralized hash table, then the lookup time is, zero of, uh, is O of 1. So it's very simple. And if you want to distribute it somehow, then the minimum overhead is... Uh, what you want to achieve is O of log N. So of course you could have also faster solutions but at very high costs. And there are two basically um, yeah. This two, yeah. So you want to have both O of uh, log N DHT hops. That means how many nodes you contact in order to reach the document that you are looking for. But also the information state and the routing state that each node holds locally should also be only O of log N. So you do not want to have uh, too much load on the nodes, both from routing information, but also not from traffic point of view. So what you want then to do with a um, distributed hash table is, so you split up the, the whole ID range, all peers are responsible for some parts, now you want to find the content that you're looking for, and for example in this case the node, uh, uh, the, the user is looking for the object ID 3107, and you need a specific routing mechanism that uses the topology of the network to come with every step closer to the desired um, peer responsible for the data item that you are looking for. So in this case, the node 3485 is responsible for these keys, so for 2907 to 3485, and there's also the desired data object 3107 inside. So somehow the message from the requesting node should arrive at that uh, peer. And that peer might either store then the content on, on, on this peer or ask for the content. That's another question. So but what we want to do is to really find a peer responsible for that data item. And um, once you found that peer that is responsible for the data item, you can access it and you can either uh, store it content on it or you can ask for the content on it but you really know that under this specific object ID is uh, the content I'm looking for. And later on of course it's uh, either yeah either the, the content is already on the node that you're looking for so that means that you also if you want to store it you store it direct directly there or there's also another type of concept, so-called indirect uh, storage, that you only tell that you have the content, and if somebody looks for the um, file, then he's told where he can, can find it. So that's basically the concept between direct storage and indirect storage. So what you can use the, the routing basically for, if you find... So this is the data object that is interesting for you. 
and you want to publish something or you want to download something with direct storage you you copy the file to that specific node that's easy to do if the file is small up to one megabyte and it's probably useful then you can directly store the content there and you're fine and if somebody else is looking for it he makes the lookup identifies that's the peer responsible for the content I'm looking for and downloads it that's good indirect storage is working a bit different there you only store your own your own uh, contact details at the corresponding peer so in this case if the file is very large for example a movie file or so then you would um, make a lookup for the peer responsible for the specific file ID and store then under this object ID that you are the node storing the file and if somebody else is looking for the content he will get the information that you have it and he can download it directly so these two concepts of direct storage or indirect storage that's uh, how you can use the distributed hash table for. In the following slides we will assume that you have direct storage because anyway at the end it doesn't matter so much because in this case you only get the additional information where you can get it from so it's only one hop more basically to ask um, and to download it. So um, yeah, this is basically a summary. So how is content stored there? Either if you have it directly, then it's uh, useful if the amount, is if the file is small, one kilobyte, probably some more kilobytes, but it still be uh, should be somehow reasonable. So you don't want to flood the network with very large files. And it's said it's not recommended for most applications. And the question is really how large the file is. If it's reasonable to send it directly, so up to one megabyte, probably I would say now, then it makes sense. If it's uh, larger, then it doesn't make sense. Yeah, in the indirect storage, instead of getting the file, you just get the contact information where you might uh, get the file from. There are still drawbacks and uh, problems because in, in this case it might also be... So the good thing is if there are more peers, then you might also get more information. So you that node is responsible. If you also want to publish the same file, then you are just listed as addi additional um, software owner and uh, file owner. That, that's the benefit. But the problem is, if the nodes are offline, then you still don't get the file and there's false information in the network. So it has both drawbacks and uh, benefits. Okay, so now we know how the basically distributed hash table concept is like, so the idea range is split and um, assigned to partially by idea ranges to the peers. We also see how it can be, the routing can be done. So the question is now what is done if a new node joins? And basically what you do as a new node, you first calculate your own ID. There are also some protocols how you identify your new ID. And then you contact the peer who is responsible for you. That means, uh, no, so, so you first have to have your own ID, then you have to contact any arbitrary node in the network, and then what typically is done is that you are uh, placed somewhere where there's either space, or if you know your ID space in bet uh, also before, then basically you have to receive some ID range, some ID space from the peers where you are located now in. Uh, so that means if you get your ID, then you get also your position, for example it's here, and then you have to get some of the IDs that were uh, c that were uh, previously response, um, um, ma maintained by this node and maintained by that node and you have to get your own ID. So you have to basically reassign the ID spaces around the place where you are now placed in. What is also needed then, because now you are responsible for a new ID space and a new ID range and uh, the peers that were previously responsible for that ID range have now to give you the key value pairs for that. So they have to inform you about the object IDs that you are now responsible for. 
And then you have to further um, be bound to the topology that you are placed in. So the main aspect of joining is uh, once you found your place in the network, you have to um, make sure that the IDs that you are responsible for, that you are also informed about them. If a node fails or departs, so the, what's the difference? Just uh, in advance, so the departure of a node typically means that the node knows that he will go offline and uh, tells uh, goodbye messages and um, some something like that. So he, in the during a departure of a node, there's still time to follow a protocol to leave the network. While failing means that the node is just switched off and there's no time to inform anybody about it. In both cases, what we have is um, that the ID space for which the node was responsible needs to be reassigned. So there are now the neighboring nodes responsible for it and they should take care that they uh, get the information about it. While if you are departing, then there's still time to copy the information that you had previously to the new nodes that are responsible for that ID range. If you fail, then somehow the key value pairs that uh, you were responsible for are lost. That's the problem. So that's why it's uh, recommended to have some redundancy, but um, that's depending on the overlay whether there's redundancy and there are further copies or not. Okay, so the main properties of uh, DHTs that we have looked at is um, to take a hash table, basically, and to distribute it over the nodes. And this is done by taking a big ID range, an ID space, from 0 to 2 to the power of um, 120, for example. And this large ID space is hacked and uh, split in smaller parts and assigned to the nodes. And nodes uh, create then a topology, and they make it, ab they make it enable it uh, to root and to find the peer responsible for a specific node ID. And how the routing and ID labeling is done that depends on the overlay. So there are several concepts, several overlays implementing this uh, concept of DHT. And how can the DHT be used for? It uh, is used for if you know what you are looking for, so if you have the object ID, then you can make a lookup request and you retrieve then the file. So it's no search anymore, but a clear routing. So in this case, of course, that means uh, you have to know what you're looking for and the, your request is then root to the responsible peer and you get the object. And what an object is, that might be a file that may, might be a user, that might be everything that's application specific. Okay, so um, in the following, so after this slide, we will see some examples for distributed hash tables. And you will um, notice that they have several parts in common. So, what is very common for them is uh, for all of the overlays, so you have a hash table, that means you have a specific ID range and how you um, split it on on the nodes. So you have a, a an overlay specific yeah, ID space and an overlay specific uh, splitting function that defines for which ID ranges your peer is responsible for. That also goes into the top next point, so mapping functions, so how the nodes are mapped to the ID space, so how their peer ID is uh, identified and how the object IDs are identified and for which object IDs appears responsible. That's also overlay specific. Then what every overlay has is uh, also a routing table that defines how you come to the objects that you are looking for. So which are the next hops if you are looking for a specific object, so there you have some specific routing tables and some rules how they are adapted if nodes join or fail. And finally, the routing algorithm that, that defines how you got, get with every hop closer to your distance. So we will see how the several overlays do it. Um, 
for the remainder of the lecture today I want to present you Quart. It's the most uh, known one, basically and most cited one. Uh, I think about over 1000 uh, citations uh, the paper has, which is a lot in the peer to peer um, research. And it has been um, published and invented 2001 and was, was really one of the first structured peer to peer overlays. So that's why it's very prominent. And if you see any kind of peer to peer example, it will be probably caught. So, how does uh, code work? So, code uses a um, SHA-1 hash function and uh, that results in a 160-bit ID space. So, both the objects and the nodes have an ID which is 106 bits long. And uh, the same hash function is used. So, for the retrieving the peer IDs, what is has been done and what is suggested is to hash the IP address and for the object IDs to hash the object name. Some people also say you should hash the object content, so the file itself. But it uh, doesn't matter at the end whether you what you hash. So I would still recommend to hash the file content because then it's unique. But it's um, still up to the user how he uses it. Okay, so what is the main idea of Cord? The main idea of Cord is also what uh, we saw, is that you have a ring with the whole ID space that wraps around after so 2 to the power of 160 minus 1 the next ID is then 0 and every node should know his predecessor so the node with the next smaller ID and ex ex its successor that means the next node in the ID range and that should be maintained so this structure should be maintained over all the time and a node is responsible for the objects between its predecessor and itself. As you know, the, every node knows the node ID of the predecessor. I, it can calculate for which objects ID it is responsible for. And already now we could do perform some uh, routing by just going around a ring to find the peer responsible for desired object ID. That would be too expensive, so that's why there are some fingers introduced. And a uh, finger is a so-called um, shortcut, or there are additional links in the network which enable a quicker lookup. So that means by having O of log n fingers, we would also have a O log n uh, lookup time. And um, just to yeah give you the next... Yeah. We will have an example next. So this is the main core topology that should be maintained all the time. Very simple. So you have uh, around here the turnaround, so the wrap from 0 to um, whatever. And just assume that the highest ID is 4047. Of course, in real code it's 160 bits long, so very large number. And um, the peers have their specific IDs, so they are located somewhere in the network. And you maintain your uh, predecessor, so the node with the smaller ID, and your successor, the node with the higher ID. And um, the red line is showing for which the peer 3485 is responsible for. And that, that is his own ID back to the predecessor. All of these IDs, so from 2907 to 3485, are assigned to that peer. So for that he is responsible for. Yes. And uh, yeah, the just to to see the the relation between the routing states. So in this case, every node knows exactly two other nodes, that means O of 1, and the routing would take, in worst case, O of n to go around the ring. Now the fingers has had been introduced, they look like this, and um, by having O of log n fingers, you also decrease the routing time to O of log n hops. And now the big question is how are these fingers created? And there's one simple rule, Basically, 
if this is the ah this is a writing mistake so better yeah still we can use it so if this is your the the id of the peer who is looking for its finger ids then he adds 2 to the power of k so like it's uh, in the example and uh, gets a list of numbers so in this case for example the peer 709 adds uh, as a first uh, plus uh, 2 to the power of 0 that means 2 plus 1 that's 710 and then the next finger is plus 2 and the third finger is plus 4 and the fourth finger is plus uh, 8 and so on and you get with this a list of object IDs like it's uh, set here so you just um, the kth finger is a peer n being so it's a peer being responsible for the object ID n plus 2 to the power of k so you get a list of object IDs and you know in the network there are some peers responsible for these object IDs and to those you create a, a shortcut so that means a link yes um, and uh, so in this case for 709 for example 965 is plus 265 uh, no, 256. Uh, 1,221 is plus 512. So it's very simple to calculate. These are the potentials of uh, 2. And as you see, uh, the node 709 has now a, a link to the peer responsible for 965, has a link to the peer responsible for 1221, has a link to the peer responsible for 1733, and has a link to the peer responsible for 2757. And now you have every node has both his uh, predecessor and successor as well as his fingers in the network. And now these fingers are used for routing. Uh, let me just uh, explain it first here. And what you can already see is that it doesn't matter for which objects you are looking for. For example, you are looking for an object which is here. With every step towards that object, you are halving the distance. That means that you have with your fingers at least um, any point in the network can now be reached by the finger and the distance to that specific point is halved. Okay, so what do we do with a new peer joints? And that is for example the new peer is 1289 and he contacts any node in the network. He might know some of the nodes, probably from somewhere else. And now the query for this specific ID is routed to the peer who is responsible for it, in this case 1622 <coughs> and it's uh, clear so the, the ID is somewhere here and we have the responsibility to the peer back to its predecessor so this is the peer responsible for it and this is also the new peer's successor and as a next step it's uh, like inserting a node in a list so that means uh, for first what you have, have to do is to set your successor so the new peer knows now his successor he asks him to uh, get the objects that the new peer is now responsible for he updates the success of the predecessor and he creates the new fingers so it's like uh, just uh, inserting a new item in a list so you update both successor and predecessor and get the information that you are now responsible for and again um, you create your fingers to that means you create fingers of peers of pn pointing to peers responsible for the object id n plus 2 to the power of k and these are your shortcuts in the network Yes, in this um, example it's uh, seen how the, the the fingers and the predecessor and successor information is used. So what you do for a query, so you first have to know what you're looking for, so you need the hash value. 
And um, in this case, the PL 1008 looks for object 3000. And by using his fingers, really the distance is halved to the goal. So where we are heading to. Yes, so the first step in this case is uh, the peer responsible for this finger, basically. So it's 1008 plus 1024. This is the object ID for which 2207 is responsible for. So this was a finger. And 2207 has some further fingers, for example, to the peer responsible for this ID. And the uh, next hop is the successor of uh, the corresponding of, of 2906. Yeah. And so you see the, f the routing is using both the fingers as well as the successor and predecessor information. And um, by halving the distance in every step, you have basically a lookup um, overhead of O log n that you can uh, calculate. So, what are the advantages? So, first of all, the lookup finds the target, so finds the object if it exists. It is uh, well scalable, so O of log n hops are required. It's also very popular, it's the main idea, it shows the main idea of DHDs, really very often cited, and uh, often used as basis for research extensions. So, typically, if there's some idea what could be taken into account for creating overlays and that's only a small modi modification. The researchers typically use um, Cord as it's very simple and uh, it's very nice to show how it yeah, can be extended. What is not inside still is that all nodes are treated equally, so if they are very strong or very weak nodes, that's not taken into account. So if you store a, no a file somewhere, and it's a very popular file, then the node who who has to offer this file, who, ha who is responsible for it, might be overloaded. Although there are probably some stronger peers in the network which would be capable to store that file. What's also not inside is that you only have unidirectional links. So as you see, the fingers are only pointing in one direction. So the back direction is not really used. And that means by maintaining the, the fingers, that's only used by one side. That's a little bit uh, waste of traffic. Ideally, it would be used by both parties. And only you have one direction, only one directional routing. That means even if uh, the um, data objects that you're looking for are, is only two or three steps back, you have to still go first one once around the, the ring. Okay, so this was the last uh, slide for today's lecture. And um, we will have now, uh, at least in half an hour, our uh, exercise uh, down, one floor down in uh, the room just across. And um, yes, so see you then. I'm not sure how many of you will come. Probably I can still say some few words about the exercise now if you want to save ta some time